Games Lifestyle Innovation Thank you everyone for joining us today in our webinar. Uh, we'll be talking today about reducing student progress loss over breaks. Very quickly, I want to tell you uh, who I am and a little bit about HIMSS. I think most people on the webinar today are at least a little familiar with HIMSS. We are assistive technology manufacturers. Our offices are based in Austin, Texas. So we have all of our sales is based out of Austin, Texas, our support. So if you purchase any products from us and they need to be repaired, that's where you would send them. So there's no customs. You're not sending them out of the country. We are native English speakers, uh, which is really, really handy when you're buying a product like this where you, you may find yourself needing some support. Uh, and a little bit by way of who I am, my name is Michelle Paley, and I've been working with HIMS for several years now. Um, before that, I worked for a couple of other assistive technology manufacturers. I am the parent of a person with uh, special needs. My daughter has some learning disabilities. She's not visually impaired, but it's given me some insight into the different ways that students with disabilities need to do things. Uh, and we also did homeschool for a while, so I have a sort of informal foray into the world of teaching, which was a, it was a good experience, I think, for both of us, and we were able to make a lot of progress with that one-on-one -on -one instruction. So here's a, a list of things that we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go over the cost and the effect of the summer slide, which is the term given to the progress lost over summer. And we'll talk about ways that teachers and parents can work together to keep students engaged in learning over breaks. I'll we'll give you some ideas for making vacation, playtime, uh, and other activities more educational. And we will give you tips for using different assistive technology devices to make summer learning more fun and more convenient, both for the student, for the parent, and for the teacher. Uh, and then I'm going to share with you some suggestions that I've gathered from fellow AT users, some TVIs that I network with online, and also some parents that we've talked to. And we're going to start really with some uh, tips and suggestions that really apply to all students. I think when it comes to the summer slide and when it comes to education in general, uh, students with disabilities and vision impairments, they don't necessarily do different things, they just do things differently. So I'm going to talk about some things that really do apply to all students, and then we'll get a little bit more specific into how students with a visual impairment would do some of these things, either with AT or without. Uh, and we have a slide here. It's a kind of a funny cartoon on here. There's a it's, a, it's a slide. It looks like a snakes and ladders slide, a little water slide. And the kid at the top has got this happy smile on, and he's carrying three books. And he gets about one third of the way down the slide, and one book flies off, and he's got two books in his hands. And he gets about two thirds of the way down this water slide, and he's got one book in his hands because another one's flying out. And when he gets to the bottom, there's this kid, and he looks a little drunk. It's kind of a funny looking kid. He's got no books in his hands. He's holding a game controller. I guess he's playing some video games. And he's got this kind of just, he looks drunk. He looks like a silly looking drunk kid. And I, th I picked this graphic for this slide because I think it's really telling about what happens over the summer. The kids at the end of the year, they're feeling smart. They took all their tests. They've accomplished a lot. And as summer goes on, they get farther and farther away from that place where they, they have all that confidence in their reading abilities and their math. And some of the things to remember, too, is that often it's the students who can least afford to lose the gains achieved who fall the farthest behind after a break. So the kids that really had to struggle to keep up during the year, those are the kids that are they're going to struggle to keep up during the summer. And any of that progress that they lose over the summer is just going to put them even further behind and give them more work for the following year. And interestingly, the magnitude of summer loss varies by grade level, subject matter, and income. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but we did find that research has shown that summer reading is the single activity most strongly and consistently related to summer learning. So again, the reading ability often suffers the most, especially among low-income students who don't have access to books at home. And this is a statistic I found really interesting. Uh, there's some research and some people that argue that most of the achievement gap between majority and minority students can be accounted for by the summer loss accumulated over 12 years of education. 
And I pulled this, this quote right from a, a study because I just thought that they worded it really well. Um, a review of 13 empirical studies representing approximately 40,000 students found that, on average, the reading proficiency levels of students from lower income families declined over the summer months, while the reading proficiency levels of students from middle income families improved modestly. Uh, in a single academic year, this decline resulted in an estimated three month achievement gap between more advantaged and less advantaged students. Between grades one and six, the potential cumulative impact of this achievement gap could compound to one and a half years worth of reading development lost in the summer months alone. And I just found that to be really surprising. I think when we think about the income gap, we think uh, that students from low income houses are just given fewer opportunities to succeed. Um, and, and really what they're saying here is that uh, simply not having access to books and not having access to reading materials during the summer months could be a, a huge part. Some tips on how to communicate goals with parents. I think, first of all, we need to let parents know that progress loss is common, also that it's serious and it's avoidable. I think um, as a parent, I know before I became a teacher through the homeschool process, uh, I didn't give a lot of weight to summer progress loss. So I think it's important for teachers to stress to parents that it is a real thing, that it is serious, and especially for students with disabilities who are combating other issues, um, just giving them reading materials and encouraging your kids to read and making that a priority in your house over the summer is going to make a big difference, not just for that school year, but for future school years. I think it's important also to set clear goals for your class, for your grade level, uh, but also for each student. So as part of their IEP, make sure that you cover things that they should be doing over the summer um, some and give specific ideas. So a lot of times you can tell parents, hey, they need to be doing this, but if you don't give them specific ideas and a specific framework, um, it, it's hard for them to really hold themselves accountable. So you want to give some specific ideas, and I'll share some of my ideas with you, things that have worked with my daughter. Uh, but you want to make summer learning fun. If you're talking about voluntary reading over the summer when the kids are on vacation and they want to be playing, you, you kind of need to find ways to sneak that in and make it fun. And whenever possible before the school year is up, include the students in the discussions um, so that both the student and the parent can hold each other accountable for the summer learning and so that they both understand how important it is. And if it's possible to create a reward system and create handouts for parents to use on their own. So if you're having a meeting with a parent and you suggest, hey, why don't you do a chart and you can get a sticker for every hour that they read, um, you might as well just make a chart, photocopy it, and hand it out to the parents. Just make it as easy and as simple and as straightforward as you can, and they're more likely to actually get that done. You also want to, if you can, make parents aware of summer reading programs offered by public libraries and other organizations. About 95% of all the public libraries across the country do offer some type of summer program. It's either a reward program or something where they keep track and they keep the kids accountable for reading throughout the summer. So if you have a program like that in your local library, and chances are you do, just make sure that the parents are made aware of that because parents, um, especially in the state of Google and digital books, they may not visit their public library as often as they should. And if they know about something like that, they may, they may make more of a point to get there. Uh, and also stress the importance of modeling, uh, the value placed on literacy in the home, the time spent reading with children, and the availability and use of reading materials are all important elements in a child's reading success. So again, if that student sees that mom is always reading, dad's always reading, they're going to be much more likely to model that behavior uh, and not see it as a punishment, but see it as something that's enjoyable and fun to do. And it's not enough to simply tell parents that it's important. Uh, again, they need to be offered concrete evidence and give them specific programs, specific instructions, uh, specific ideas that they can do to participate in literacy as a family. And if possible, get your school and your PTA involved. I think as a teacher, you don't need to do this alone. Um, if your school is willing to, host a workshop for the parents. Have as many parents as you can get together come in during one evening and uh, educate them on the importance of summer reading, on the importance 
of not letting the kids lose that progress over the summer. And if you can get the PTA to help, you know, teachers go on vacation for the summer, but the PTA is mainly parents, they don't get a vacation. Uh, and I think you'll find that some of those volunteers uh, will probably be more than happy to help host a summer reading workshop. Uh, and one of the other ideas too, if you do have a workshop, have the parents create an FEP, which is kind of like an IEP, uh, except that it's a family education plan. Uh, if, you, if you can get the parents to, to create a family education plan and not necessarily singling out the one student who needs to study over the summer, but to come up with a plan for the entire family where they're going to maybe uh, write letters to family once a week, or they're all going to read for half an hour in the evening as a family to do it together to make it more fun. Uh, and again, to make it less like school, it doesn't need to be structured, but anytime you can put things in writing, have the family create an FEP in writing, uh, it just holds them more accountable to getting things done. And here's some specific tips that you can give to parents, or if you're a parent, that you can use yourself. Uh, number one, set limits for screen time. Those kids need to be outside, they need to be playing board games, um, even if they're not reading. Just that interaction with other kids, um, it just keeps the brain going a lot better than TV time. But when you are watching TV, here's another tip. Turn on the captioning and reduce the volume, thus forcing the kids to rely a little bit more on that text and sort of subconsciously getting them to read uh, when they feel like they're watching TV. Also, another tip is that uh, letting kids read books that seem slightly below their reading level is not necessarily a bad thing. You want to challenge them and give them books that are on their reading level, but reading books that are a little bit below that level or have become old favorites can help them foster confidence and fluency. Uh, and also it's probably a little bit more fun in the summer when they want to be reading for fun. Uh, and then another tip is to use daily routines to provide authentic learning experiences. I think we overlook a lot of these little opportunities. So when you're cooking, have, have a recipe out. Pull up a recipe and let the children or let your student follow a recipe instead of just telling them what to do when you're cooking dinner. Um, if they want to go see a movie, get the local paper, pull out the computer, let them read the movie listings, let them read the movie synopsis instead of watching the trailer. Uh, if the children are going to be making lunch, let them read the directions and microwave their own frozen dinner. Um, just these little things that they can be doing uh, to force a little education on them without them noticing. Another tip uh, to give the kids books instead of iPads when you go on a car trip. Uh, and also you could, there's, you know, in this world of, of Pinterest, there are tons of activities online that you can use on rainy days. And instead of showing your children how to do things, let them read the instructions from Pinterest. Let them read instructions for different crafts and have that be a natural bridge between the tactile activity and reading practice. You can also encourage your kids to write your grocery list for you or to create a to-do list. Uh, again, have them write postcards or short messages to family members. Let them send emails to people and tell them about their week and what they did that week during the summer. Uh, one thing that I did with my daughter that she just loved, and reading was a hot button issue for her for a long time, uh, we created kind of a scavenger hunt. So I got some type of a, a small prize, a hostess cupcake or whatever um, I thought would be exciting for her. And I created little hints and I hid them around the house. So there would be one that said, look under the bed and don't bump your head or just make up silly things like that. And when she got under the bed, there would be another note that said, uh, your next clue is somewhere cold. Look where the fridge or, or something like that. And so we had these different clues. And in order to find the next clue around the house, she had to read the first one. And she found that to be super fun. She didn't think about that as work at all. She didn't complain. And at the end, there was some sort of a small treat for her. Another thing you could do um, to get away from a little bit of reading, if you want to do a little bit of math, uh, when you're doing your grocery store trips, let the kids round up to the nearest dollar and make a contest out of seeing who can round up and guess the total at the register the soonest. Uh, and another idea, and I do this with my daughter again too, encourage children to wear a watch during the day and be responsible for keeping time and returning home when asked. Uh, that's not necessarily math, but it's a good life skill and it's good for them to be able to read a watch. I've made sure too that her watch is not digital. <laughs> she has a watch and it's got all 12 numbers on the face and it's got the two hands. 
uh, because I do want her to be able to read that. And I want her to get the, the spatial relationship between 10 minutes, 20 minutes, um, and to be able to come home without having to tell her friend, I have to be home at six, remind me. Um, and that's gone over really well with her. Uh, and then we're going to transition a little bit into assistive technology. A few things to keep in mind for students with visual impairments who, again, are going to be doing the same things, but they're going to be doing them a little differently. Um, visually impaired students benefit from all the same principles that may do or achieve them in different ways. You want to find out what assistive technology students have at home and if possible, if they need to, find out if they can borrow the school equipment over the break uh, if the situation warrants that. So if a, a student needs a book reader or if they need a braille display to be able to read and write and practice over the summer and they don't have one at home, find out if they can borrow one from the school over the summer. You want to also make sure that the parents know the capabilities of the assistive technology in use and have a contact person to reach out to if they have questions over a break. Uh, and that may be that they they need the phone number to the manufacturer so that they can call with questions. Or it may be that you have someone who's available over the summer, a trainer, someone maybe at the Department of Blind Services, um, that they can call with questions if they need to. Uh, and then another tip is to load materials yourself as a teacher to the memory cards or to a shared folder if you can load things to Dropbox for parents to download later their worksheets or assignments or books or whatever you can find that's on the child's level. If you can kind of load that parent up with the tools that they'll need over the summer, uh, again, you're going to be a lot more likely to take advantage of that and make it happen. So we are going to switch gears now. I have Andy Leach on the line. He is one of our regional territory managers for Hims Inc. Uh, and he's he's going to explain a few of the ways that we can use some of the HIMSS products to accomplish some of these goals and to keep the kids reading, keep the kids thinking over the summer. So Andy, I'm going to be quiet and hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Michelle. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you guys are having a good Tuesday out there. As Michelle said, uh, I'm Andy Leach, and I'm one of the, the regional managers here at HIMSS Inc. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, being a blind guy myself, I can relate to some of these things. Um, although I think we have an advantage today. You know, when I was little, when I was first learning to read, I used to check braille volumes out of the library and bring those home to keep reading over the summer. And the important thing to remember is that if you're a, a sighted uh, student, you're going to read day to day without realizing it, whether you're looking at signs, whether somebody tells you you're at a movie theater, hey, look over there, look at that. You know, this, some of this stuff is just going to come without even thinking about it. And as a blind or a visually impaired person, you miss some of those opportunities when it comes to learning. So that's where some of the technology comes into play. You know, you can, you can use, uh, I mean, I'm going to reference a lot of HIMSS products here today, but you can reference any adaptive technology product that someone uses at school They're going to benefit from using at home. You know, if you're a, a low vision person and you use magnification at school, whether it's to look at signs, whether it's to use it for handwriting, whether it's to, um, you know, look at anything, distance, close up, a book. You can do those same things in the summer. It's really just a matter of carrying on what you're doing. Um, the same thing would be, you know, with our portable magnifiers to read things at a at a distance to for handwriting. Uh, the same thing goes for the desktop. If you're involved in a craft that you might do over the summer, all these things that you learn about in school can continually continue to be used over the summer. If you're a Braille user, um, having access to Braille helps. And, and if you can't check it out of the school, there's things you could do like put a free screen reader on to a PC. Or um, maybe you could get a hold of an older Braille display if the school won't allow you to check something out. But anytime you can practice with, with input, with output, with reading, you know, so many of the things that Michelle spoke of, like a, a grocery list, 
you could easily do that on one of our Braille displays or a note taker. You could easily uh, follow recipes. For example, in, if uh, you're talking about Michelle made reference to making lunch or cooking dinner, uh, you could easily say if you had one of our Blaze products, you could easily scan in a recipe and then follow the steps. Or if you were a Braille product user, you could easily type that recipe in and make a game out of, of uh, making a file for recipes. And then when you wanted to go back and, and get to that again, you could bring it up and start the process again. So these tools don't have to be used just, oh, we're going to read this book today. Go download that Bookshare book, and I want you to read the first three chapters. You, know, you can also use them for fun, for everyday activities, for things that a student wants to do. Because that's what we're going to do in real life anyway. These tools are, are something that we get introduced to for education and so that we can do things that our sighted counterparts are doing. But ultimately, they become our livelihood. Whether, and that, you know, whether you're a low vision person and you need magnification through a portable handheld device, like the Candy 5 HD2, or you use a desktop product like the Lifestyle or um, the eBot, or whether you use Braille and you need a note taker or a Braille display. So these things start out as, as ways for us to level the playing field in education, but what they end up doing is leveling the playing field for life. So they don't have to just be used for school, but used for, for anything around the house, for any aspect of life. So Andy, along those lines, do you want to talk quickly about a few of our products, uh, maybe starting with the Candy and then the eBot, and explain some of the features that make these devices uh, sort of unique among their product types? Yeah, I mean, some of the things uh, that, that would make our Candy unique is that you can, it's a five-inch portable HD magnifier. So, so some of the things that make it unique are the ability to self-view, so that could even come in handy with grooming, with something you wanted to look at yourself, like a uh, woman's makeup or anything like that. Also, the ability to capture images, so if you needed to capture something and then remember it, you would have that capability. It also has a three-position handle, so whether you're left-handed, right-handed, or you look at things straight on, this gives you the ability to look at signage. Say if you were in a movie theater, or what if you went to your local swimming pool or recreation center? Uh, it's not a distance. It is not a distance viewing device that you would look at something from you know 50 feet away, but it is definitely a tool that could be helpful to look at signage, close-up places, or to be used in the grocery store to look at something on a higher level shelf. Uh, it just gives you more independence. That's a, that's a little bit about our candy. The eBot is a product that many of you may be familiar with, but it can connect with iPads. It can connect with Android devices. It can connect with Macs and PCs and laptops. So no matter what your tool of, of, that you want to use on the fly, all those environments can be used as a tool for viewing with the eBot. And then if you're someone that has a big TV at your house, you know, a 55-inch TV, for example, you can connect to that. So you could use an iPad or an Android tablet when you're on the go. And then when you're at home, if you have a big TV, you can plug into the HDMI port and uh, really be able to magnify things. So... At the end of the day, when maybe your eyes are under more strain, that could be a real benefit. Not to mention the fact that no one else, there are no other devices out there that offer that many connectivity options. So that's also something to consider. And these devices are great for things that you want to do under it, like handwriting or reading or crafts, but they also offer a distance view, which they tell me is very, very good, even at a distance of, say, 30 feet across a room. And two out of 
three models have OCR. So again, getting back to what I said earlier, at the end of the day when maybe you're feeling a little bit tired or your eyes maybe aren't as good as they are at 9 o'clock in the morning, but you have something that you want to read, you have that ability to. So all tools that can help you not only do your academic pursuits, but daily life. And then next up, Andy, I have the uh, Braille Sense, and then I have the Braille Displays. The Braille Sense is a great tool. It, our note takers, no matter what flavor you like, the QWERTY model, the uh, whether they ate the uh, QWERTY model or the Braille Sense U2, both of those are 32 cells of Braille, or the Braille Sense U2 Mini, which is 18 cells of Braille. They all use the same firmware, and they give you access to things like Dropbox, Excel Viewer, so you can actually look at a spreadsheet. They give you access to Dropbox, so you can exchange files. Bookshare Download, one of my favorite things there, because uh, I am a reader and I'm kind of a news junkie. So I love to be able to load my device up with newspapers and magazines and uh, um, be able to have access to them that way. But again, these devices are, are designed for us, for blind people, offering some of the things we need, like access to Bookshare and NLS Bard and Learning Ally. But they also have things on there that, that our sighted counterparts are going to be using as well, Facebook, um, um, Dropbox, Excel Viewer. So organizational things as well, you know, an appointment calendar, that kind of thing. Also, um, access to both wireless and Bluetooth connectivity, so you have flexibility there. And uh, they're just great tools for whether you want speech or Braille or both. Um, great tools with portability that you can have with you. And um, our Blaze products, if you're not familiar with, with those, the Blaze EZ has been out there, and the Blaze ET is coming very soon. These are great portable digital book players. They have all the things you would expect, uh, NLS, Bookshare, uh, Learning Ally. They have built-in voice recorders. You can store all your music on them. They have 12 gigs of onboard memory, plus whatever you want to put into an SD card. But the neat thing about these devices is that they also have OCR capability. So, uh, you know, if you're in a restaurant and you want to read a menu, you can do that. If you're in a meeting and someone forgets to give you, you that, oh, I forgot, I didn't make that handout braille, or I didn't read it to them in advance, well, that's okay. You know, you take a uh, scan of it with one of the Blaze devices and you have your earphones in and away you go. So uh, just another way to level the playing field both in education as well as life. 